We come this evening to a consideration of the words to be found in the epistle to the Romans in chapter 6 and verse 19. The 19th verse in the 6th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. Now, we all, I take it, uh, remember that I was suggesting last Friday evening that uh, this verse corresponds in many respects to verses 12 and 13 in this sixth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. The apostle really is doing the same thing, in a sense, twice over in this chapter, but he's doing it in a slightly different manner. His first argument, you remember, ran from verse 1 to 14, and this second argument runs from verse 15 to the end of the chapter. And I was indicating last week that in many ways, verse 18 corresponds to verse 11, and in exactly the same way, this 19th verse corresponds to verses 12 and 13. In other words, his method is this. He lays down a doctrine, and then he makes an appeal on the basis of that doctrine. Having stated in verse 11, Likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, he makes the appeal, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof, etc. And having told us in verse 18, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Because of that, he now goes on to make this exhortation and appeal that is to be found in this 19th verse. And then he will support it by additional arguments in verses 20 to 23. Well now, as we come to this verse, we are struck at once, of course, by this preliminary statement which the apostle makes before he proceeds to address his appeal or to make his exhortation to these Roman Christians. He does something which is rather unusual here. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Now, what is he referring to there? Well, he is referring to the way in which he has been using an illustration or an analogy. You remember he began to do that in verse 16. Know ye not, he says, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Now there he's, be he's been beginning to use an illustration from the realm of slavery. And he's kept it up. Because we saw last week in verse 18, he says, being then made free from sin, ye became enslaved to righteousness. Or you became the slaves of righteousness. So he is still continuing this same illustration. And indeed, when he comes to his practical exhortation, he goes on using it. He says, for as ye have yielded or presented your members slaves to uncleanness, even so now present your members slaves to righteousness and to holiness. He's continuing, in other words, with this illustration of his from the world and the realm of slavery. And what he refers to in this extraordinary phrase is his own use of this illustration. He says, I speak after the manner of men. Now, that means not that he was speaking as a man or uh, using a human language because he couldn't speak in any other way. He was a man, and he can only speak in human terms and in human language. What he means by after the manner of men is that he is using a familiar illustration from ordinary life. 
He isn't referring to the terminology, to the words as such, but to the fact that he has indeed been using an illustration at all. That's what he's saying. Well, now then, why does he say this? Why does he uh, use this uh, particular uh, terminology here? Why, why, why does he call attention to what he's doing? Why didn't he just go on uh, with his illustration? Why does he turn aside uh, to make a comment on his own procedure? Now, this is an extremely interesting point. It is, as I say, something rather unusual with the apostle, therefore we must look into it. Now, there are some who have thought that the apostle here was apologizing for using an illustration. That he, he uh, feels that uh, there is a sense in which a preacher of the gospel shouldn't use an illustration at all. Or that he was apologizing uh, for the particular illustration that he used. It seems to me that that is an entirely uh, false explanation of what the apostle is here doing, as I hope to show you. There's nothing to apologize for at all. It isn't that he's temporarily forgotten himself and has been speaking after the manner of men in this way. There's, there's no, no apology here. Well, what is it? Well, it's something much more significant and much more important. The apostle is explaining why he used the illustration. Not apologizing for it, but explaining why he did it. And there, of course, is something that really is interesting and important at one and the same time. So here is a matter that is of great significance and of importance as regards teaching methods. It's very important for all preachers in particular, but it's important for anybody, whoever uses an illustration or a figure in an attempt to elucidate it and to make plain the truth of the scriptures. Now then, let us try to see the reasons why the apostle has used his uh, illustration about uh, slavery. He tells us why he used it and uh, the explanation of his having done so. The first thing is this. He has used his illustration in order to make the subject matter clear. That's obviously the first meaning of this phrase. He says, I, I speak. I I'm speaking to you after the manner of men in this way by using this illustration from the uh, familiar fact of slavery. And of course, they were very familiar with slavery in those days. He says, now, I I'm doing this because I'm so anxious to make my point plain and clear to you. Now, there is a very important point. That, I wouldn't hesitate to assert, is always the only reason for using an illustration. It's the only reason for ever using an illustration. A man should never use an illustration merely to tell a good story or to bring out a rather clever illustration. Is there any need to say that, says someone? I suggest there is great need to say it. Because the use of stories and of illustrations always makes an appeal to the flesh. People always like that sort of thing. Uh, congregations generally like preachers to talk about themselves and to tell stories about themselves and to illustrate things out of their own lives. Always, it's always liked and people like a story and people like an illustration. And it can be a very real snare. But it seems to me that the apostle is teaching us here that there is only one way of justifying the use of an illustration and a story, and that is to make the meaning plain and clear. You notice that so far in this epistle, the apostle has not done this at all before. This is the first time he does it. The apostle Paul doesn't tell stories. He doesn't throw illustrations about. He does so here, but he seems to feel the need of explaining why he's done so. Not apologizing, I say, but giving an explanation. Now, 
The business of preaching or of teaching is always to make the meaning and the matter plain and clear. Always. That is a canon from which I imagine no one would dissent. It is the business of any exposition to make the meaning plain and clear. Holding that in our minds, it seems to me, therefore, that there are two extremes that we've always got to avoid. Two dangers, if you like, that we must always avoid. One is the danger of being childish. And this, I think, is a very real danger today, if I may say so, with temerity in evangelical circles. The great word is the word simple. Oh, so, so marvelously simple, they say. Well, to be simple, of course, is right as long as we mean by that that the meaning is plain and clear. But we should never be childish. And we should never treat people as children, as such. And if we merely tell them stories and spoon-feed them, we are really treating them as children. Do we realize the significance of this? Let me do what the apostle does at this very point, and I do it solely to make this thing quite clear. I remember preaching on one occasion, and a man said to me at the end, he said, you know, you only gave us one illustration this evening. The last time he said, I remember there were several. Well, now, I immediately examined that man. The man was a bit of a poet. And I had no doubt at all in my own mind that that man was really only interested in the stories and illustrations in a sermon. That was the sort of thing that appealed to him. And uh, there is no doubt that this did become a very real danger in the Christian church and still is up to a point that we are just entertaining by means of stories and pictures, analogies and illustrations. And we must never do that. But then there's the other danger at the other extreme, which I do not think is the danger today, but I think was very definitely the danger in the last century, and particularly in certain circles. I'm thinking, for instance of what is said to be a perfectly true story of people going out of a service in Edinburgh one Sunday morning when the great preacher, the great pulpit here, which they had last century, you remember, uh, had been delivering uh, this tremendous sermon. And they were walking out, and a poor woman was walking out amongst others. And somebody turned to her and said, uh, Well... Uh, did you enjoy the service? And she said, yes, it was wonderful. Well, said this man, did you, were you able to follow the, the argument? And she said, far be it from me to presume to be able to follow and to understand the mind of such a great preacher. Well, now there it is. You see, there's the other extreme. And undoubtedly, that was the position in the Victorian period and I'm mentioning it for this reason only. I am convinced that that is one of the main explanations of the state of the Christian church today. These great preachers who went into the pulpit with their academic sermons, which they generally read, and the great bulk of the congregation had no idea as to what they were talking about. But why did they go, you say? Ah, oh, well... Somehow or other, you see, they were given the feeling that it was rather wonderful to be listening to this which was so great that they couldn't understand it. Forgetting that the business of a preacher and of a sermon, as I'm emphasizing, is to make the meaning plain. I'm using this analogy, says the apostle, in order that you may understand what I'm talking about, what I'm saying. And it is the only reason for using an illustration or an analogy. They must never be used to entertain or to bring a kind of glory to the men who has told a good story. And of course, the very depth of this point, this matter is reached when you hear of men even keeping notebooks and if they hear a tale or a story, putting it down in the notebook so that they can bring it out. And thus, congregations are amused and entertained by stories and illustrations 
for the sake of stories and of illustrations. The great apostle never did that. He's not defending that. He's, he's saying that the only reason, and I must repeat it, for using such an analogy is that it does help to make the meaning plain and clear. But let us go on to a second matter. The second point is this. He uses his analogy because he is anxious to avoid and to prevent a serious misunderstanding of what he is saying. Not only you see, is he, does he want to make it plain and clear, he realizes that there is the possibility of a serious misunderstanding of what he's saying. Or, if I may use a scriptural phrase, he was afraid that they might wrest the truth unto their own destruction. Now, that's from the Apostle Peter, you remember, in the uh, second epistle and in the third chapter towards the end. He's, he talks about these writings of his beloved brother Paul, in which he says there are some things which are hard to be understood, which the unlearned and the unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures uh, to their own destruction. Now the apostle realized, therefore, that uh, there was a danger of what he was saying at this point being misunderstood. So he takes up this analogy of slavery in order to put the point plain and clear. Now what is he safeguarding? I think he's safeguarding this. He has said in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Ah, that's a dangerous thing to say. You are not under the law. Now then, the apostle was so afraid that some of these people might say, Oh, very well, we are not under the law. We needn't be bothered about our conduct and behavior any longer. We need have no concern now then about righteousness. We are free. We are absolutely free. We were slaves. We are now free. Wait a minute, says Paul. You are not. You are now slaves to righteousness. You are enslaved to righteousness. He's just been saying that at the end of verse 18. In other words, he wants them to see that the man who is no longer under the law is now under law to Christ. He is not free from righteousness. No, no, he is free to righteousness. He is set free to the practice of righteousness. And he is so anxious that nobody should imagine that not being under the law means that you're absolutely free. He says, no, no, you're, you're no longer slaves to sin, but you are slaves to righteousness. Now, he says, I put it like that. In terms of this analogy of slavery and of a man being a slave of one master and then another coming and buying him out of that and delivering him from that and making him his own slave, I put it like that, says Paul. In order that nobody might rest my statement about being no longer under the law to his own destruction. That's why he used the analogy. He saw that he must put it so plainly and clearly that nobody could be in any kind of misapprehension or uncertainty with regard to his teaching. And then I go on to a third reason for his use of the analogy. At least I'm concerned at this moment with his explanation of why he did use it and why he uh, calls attention to his use of it. And that is the limits of an illustration. Don't you detect that in this statement of his? He says, I, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, he says, now, don't be mistaken about this. There are limits to an illustration. An illustration is of value. It does help to make the meaning plain and clear. It does help to safeguard us against misinterpretation. But he says, after all, I'm descending, as it were, in using an illustration and an analogy. Because no illustration is perfect. And no illustration must be pressed too exactly. He's saying that to us. He's saying, I've used an analogy, yes, but um, don't now press this absolutely, otherwise you'll have the truth in its wrong proportions. 
There is a kind of slavery in the Christian life, but it isn't like that old slavery. The form of slavery is no longer identical with the other. Therefore, says the apostle, when I've just used this term about your being enslaved to righteousness, well, don't be mechanical in your interpretation. Don't say that this slavery is identical in every respect to the other slavery, for it isn't. There is a difference. There is a similarity, and yet it, there is a difference. What is it? It's this. Under sin, the slavery was the slavery of the compulsion of what we may call the strong man armed. You remember our Lord's phrase. He says, the strong man armed keepeth his goods at peace. That's a, p a picture of the mankind in sin, under the tyranny and the dominion and the rule and the sovereignty of the devil and of evil. The strong man armed keepeth his goods at peace. It's a tyranny. It's a totalitarian tyranny of the worst type. That's it. That's the one form of slavery. There is no freedom there at all. But this other, he says, which I have called being enslaved to righteousness or slaves to God and to Christ. This is different. And this is where every analogy breaks down, you see. He says, my analogy doesn't take me far enough now. I've had to put it in this form in order to make it clear to you and to safeguard the truth. But now, it, it isn't adequate. Let me therefore show you what I mean, he seems to say. There is something very wonderful about our relationship to righteousness, and it's this. That it at one and the same time combines the elements of slavery and freedom. In this there is a kind of compulsion, yes, but it isn't the same compulsion as before. A man who is a Christian is in a sense a slave, yes, but he isn't a slave in the sense that he was before. In what, what's the difference? It's this. He is now a slave to love. The element of love comes in. And it changes the whole position. Now is this clear? A man who is in love, of course, is a slave. He is absolutely lost. He lives for the other, for the object of his love. And the one whom he loves really controls him in a, in a totalitarian sense. Yes, but what a difference between that and the slavery of some terrible potentate, some awful tyrant. You see, there's a sense in which it is right to say that both of them are in a condition of slavery. And yet you don't leave it just as, at that. You've got to explain the difference in the slavery. In the second case, it's the willing slavery. Well, let me use another statement made by this great apostle in order to show exactly what he means. Formerly, the compulsion of which we were aware was the compulsion of the tyranny of Satan and of sin. Black and terrible and awful. What is it now? Well, now he says it's this. The love of Christ constraineth me. Do you remember that beautiful, that wonderful phrase in 2 Corinthians 5? The love of Christ constraineth me. And what it means is this. He says he's like a man in a vice. And the vice is being tightened up. There's pressure. There's compulsion. Yes, but what's bringing the pressure? Oh, it is the love of Christ. It's no longer a horrible tyranny. It is love. It's the tyranny of love, if you like. Here's a paradox, and this is the paradox of the whole Christian faith and the Christian position. The Christian is not a free man. He's a man who is, if you like, under the tyranny of love. The love of Christ constraineth me. So he says, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He's the bond slave of Jesus Christ. Yes, but that's all the time a relationship which is one of love. And therefore the apostle, it seems to me here, is, is just explaining that to us. What he, you see, was concerned to bring out was this. 
that there is a compulsion in both cases. There is a certainty of obedience in both cases. But the moment you've said that, everything else is different. The man who is a Christian is under this power of righteousness. He was under the power of sin before. Yes, he's under the power of righteousness now. Don't think of it as a detached question. He's not a man who's absolutely free and detached and who may do this or that. No, no. There is a power in righteousness. We are under grace. Yes, says the apostle, that is common. And therefore, there is an element of certainty in this as there was an element of certainty in the other. So that what he is really concerned to say and this is his big point, is that the man who has been delivered from being under the law is a man who will never be in the position of saying, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? The thing is quite impossible because now he is under this compelling, constraining power of love and of righteousness. And therefore that question is something which is quite unthinkable and utterly impossible. So the apostle says, now I speak after the manner of men because uh, of your infirmity. Be careful, he says, how you make use even of my illustration. It only helps us up to a point beyond that it doesn't take us. Very well, but that brings me to the last uh, meaning to this extraordinarily illuminating phrase. The final reason for his using his illustration and analogy, he tells us, was because of the infirmity of your flesh. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. What does this mean? Well, here is a, a tremendous statement which throws tremendous light upon the whole question of the approach to the New Testament. What is he saying? Well, note this. He does not say, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your intellects or your mind. He doesn't say that. He says, because of the infirmity of your flesh. Here, I say, is one of those central, vital points in the whole of the New Testament teaching. He doesn't say intellect. And I'm emphasizing it for this good reason, that if he had said intellect, well, then he would be putting a premium on intellect. And he would be saying, well, now, of course, if you only had greater brains and greater intellects and greater understandings, I needn't have used my illustration at all. You would have understood the complete truth as it was, as I stated it in my doctrine. But he isn't saying anything of the kind. And he never does say anything of the kind. And the New Testament as a whole, thank God, never says any such thing. No, what he does say is because of the infirmity of your flesh. What is the flesh? Well, the flesh means all the faculties of man as influenced by and perverted by and controlled by sin. That is what the flesh means. It doesn't mean the physical body. We've come across that term, the body, before. We found it in verse 12. This isn't the body here, this is the flesh, which is a very different thing. The flesh means the faculties of the body as dominated, perverted, and misused by sin. And he says it is the infirmity of the flesh, not of the mind and intellect alone, that makes it necessary for him to use his illustration. Now, why do I say that this is so tremendously important? Well, for this reason. That according to this biblical teaching, man's trouble by nature is never that he merely lacks intellect. 
What he does lack is spiritual understanding. Man's trouble is not in his mind. What is it then? Well, man's trouble is in the capacity and the ability to understand and to believe and to follow spiritual truth. Here, you see, is the essential biblical doctrine of sin and of men in sin as the result of the fall. What is the most devastating result of the fall? Well, it is undoubtedly this, that man in the fall has lost the capacity for spiritual apprehension. Now, before the fall, he had it. Before the fall, Adam was able to commune freely with God and to have fellowship with him. The moment he fell and sin came in, he lost that capacity. Spiritual apprehension, spiritual comprehension, spiritual understanding. Now this is a very, very vital uh, distinction. You see it, of course, worked out in, at great length in the passage that I read to you at the beginning out of the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. He starts dealing with it around about verse 20 in chapter 1, and he goes right on with it, down to the middle of chapter 3. It's the great statement there, and it's a tremendously important one. The most devastating thing, I say, that sin does to men is to rob him of his power of spiritual apprehension. Let me put it to you like this. The whole matter of becoming a Christian and of believing the Christian truth and having the Christian faith is not essentially a matter of intellect at all. And I say again, thank God for that. As the apostle argues, men of great natural capacity, of great intellects, great minds, great brains, great knowledge, great natural understanding see nothing whatsoever in Christianity. Indeed, as he says, they see nothing in it but utter folly. He says the, the Greeks regard it as a stumbling, the Jews regard it as a stumbling block and the Greeks regard it as foolishness. He says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he because they are spiritually discerned. Now these men have got wonderful brains, great intellects, but when you put them face to face with this, they see nothing in it at all. Talk to them about the soul. There isn't such a thing. This is nonsense. Hold them before the Lord Jesus Christ, tell them about his incarnation, the two natures in one person. Nonsense, folly, they say. Hold them before the doctrine of the atonement and the death upon the cross. They say, this is rubbish, it's immoral. They denounce it, they laugh at it, they ridicule it. Why? Ah, it's because they're lacking in this faculty of spiritual apprehension, spiritual understanding. It's got nothing to do with the intellect, nothing whatsoever. And then, you see, we can put the other side by putting it like this. On the other hand, there are simple people, ordinary people, poor brains, very little intellect and understanding. And yet, they are able to understand these things. They rejoice in them. They revel in them. How are they enabled to do so? Oh, says the apostle, this is solely the result of the work of the Holy Spirit upon them. When the Son of God was in the world, the, the princes of this world didn't know him. For had they known him, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well then, how can anybody be a Christian? Oh, he says, God hath revealed these things unto us by his Spirit, the Spirit which searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For we have received not the spirit that is of the world, but the spirit that is of God, that we might understand the things that are freely given to us of God. It is all a matter of the illumination of the spirit. And the apostle, of course, you remember, glories in this. Listen to him saying it to the Corinthians. For ye see your calling, brethren. And remember, this is one of the greatest brains that the world has ever known speaking. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's it. It is nothing to do with, with, with intellect and natural ability and understanding. And the apostle glory is in that fact. Is it putting a premium then upon ignorance? Not at all. It's just saying that this isn't the determining factor. A man shouldn't boast of his knowledge. He shouldn't boast of his ignorance either. A man shouldn't boast of his great brain. A man shouldn't boast of the fact that he hasn't got a great brain. And you realize that we need to say that on both sides, don't we? The temptation to some people is to boast about their great brains. But never forget that there is the equal temptation to the others to say, well, of course, I'm just an ordinary man, you know. And as he says it, he's oozing out self-righteousness and pride. I'm not one of those men who understands your theology. I'm just the, the man who carries the bag of the preacher or something like that. Ah, it's the same unhealthy and vile and foul pride. No, no, you don't put a premium on either brains or lack of it or knowledge or lack of it. Neither of them matters. It is the illumination of the Spirit alone that counts. But what an important thing this is. I'm not proposing on all future Friday evenings to refer, as I did last Friday evening, to that brain's trust, so-called. But I must refer to it once more. As I say, I happened to hear that repeat of that program last week, and in addition to what I told you last Friday, I heard this. A question, another question that was put to the brain's trust was this one. Why, said a questioner, why does it seem to be the case that uh, people on the brain's trust seem to be able to answer and to discuss uh, with ease and freedom and intelligence uh, questions which are put to them on subjects which happen to be right out their own particular field of interest and of study, they seem to be able to do that with comparative ease and freedom. But why is it that when it becomes a question of theology, they don't seem to be able to do it here in the same way as they can do with other subjects? For instance, some of the members of the Brains Trust are literary people. And yet a question may come up on a scientific matter. And though they don't know much about science and are not specialists in any sense of the term in science, they seem to be able to talk about science quite freely and seem to be able to do so in an intelligent manner. But, says the questioner, I've noticed that when it becomes a question of theology, they don't seem to be able to do so. And that was the question before the Brains Trust. And uh, they seem to be quite incapable of answering the question. And the reason for that, of course, was the very thing that we are discussing at this particular moment. They were trying to say that uh, here, of course, if you didn't know the terminology, or if you hadn't been reading a lot of it and were not well versed in it, you wouldn't be able to take part that some or other in connection with theology, that seemed to be necessary, not with other subjects. But that's got nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. There is only one explanation why the learned members of the Brains Trust cannot speak freely about these matters, and it is this. They are matters that are spiritually discerned. And the greatest natural mind and brain is useless here. It's another realm which can only be introduced and into which one can only be introduced as the result of the operation of the Holy Spirit himself. It's another realm. It's the realm of the spiritual. Art and music and science and politics and all those things, they belong ultimately to the same realm. This doesn't belong to the same realm. And a man is completely at sea here until he has been given the illumination of the Spirit, until he has this new faculty. This is indeed something to glory in. 
face to face with Christianity, we are all on the same level. That's what proves, you see, it's God's way of salvation. If it had been men's way of salvation, it would depend upon our minds and intellects and understandings. And then, of course, some people would have a great advantage over others. But God has contrived a way of salvation in which nobody has an advantage over anybody else. We are every one of us reduced to the same level, complete helplessness, absolute impotence. No brain is of value. No lack of brain is of value. We are all in the same position. We are all on the same level. We all fail to the same degree. We are all equally helpless. And on the other side, there is therefore a corresponding hope of salvation for all types. What a wonderful salvation this is. That is why I say again, it doesn't matter at all to the preacher in this ultimate evangelistic sense, what is the character of the people who are sitting in front of him. He knows they're all sinners. He's not interested whether they've got great brains or little brains. He's not at all interested if they're the most cultured people in the world or the most ignorant people in the world. He knows they're all sinners. He knows they've all got a blind spot where God and spiritual truth are concerned and that they can do nothing about it that they need the illumination of the Spirit, every one of them. And he knows, therefore, that there is an equal hope for all. What a gospel that has baffled the greatest philosophers that the world has ever known and yet can save in a moment a man in the heart of Africa who can't even read and write. That's the gospel. What a glorious gospel it is. The apostle says, the difficulty about understanding the truth lies in the infirmity of your flesh. That's where it is. It isn't your minds. It's this fallen nature. It's the loss of this spiritual power of apprehension. It's in the flesh. Not the mind, not the intellect, in the flesh. And that is why he says, I've had to use my illustration. But let us, to make it complete, notice this. That though we are born again and illuminated of the Spirit, we are still imperfect in this respect. Don't misunderstand what I've just been saying in this way. That because this understanding is the result of the illumination of the Spirit, and because we must all have that illumination, and because all who are Christians have had that illumination, that therefore every Christian is identical with every other and is in exactly the same position as regards understanding and comprehension. It doesn't follow at all. Now then, this is a very important addition, isn't it? We know nothing of spiritual truth at all apart from the illumination of the Spirit. But having had the illumination of the Spirit, there are all kinds and possibilities of variation and of amount of understanding. What you mean, says someone, I mean this. I mean that the faculty that is given to us by the Holy Spirit can be developed by us. Now, did you notice how the apostle put that to the Corinthians? He says, look here, I could not speak unto you hitherto as unto wise, but even as unto babes in Christ. He says, I couldn't speak the wisdom I've just been talking about to you because you are yet carnal. He says, I couldn't feed you with meat because you're babes. I had to give you milk. How be it, he says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And you see, what makes the difference in the various gradations amongst the Christians is the extent to which they have used or have failed to use this power, this faculty that has been given to them by the Holy Spirit. Let the author of the epistle to the Hebrews support and clinch the thing that the Apostle Paul has been saying. 
You remember that he tells them in chapter 5 that he wanted to tell them a great deal more about the doctrine of our Lord and Savior as the Melchizedek, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He says, I've got many things to say about this and things which are hard to be understood because you are dull of hearing. He says, wherefore, whereas ye ought to be teachers in these matters, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the doctrines of Christ, and have need of milk and of not of strong meat. Why? Well, he tells them, because they had not been exercising their senses in the matter of understanding. They had been content to remain as babes. And the result was he couldn't give them that deeper teaching, that higher doctrine that he was so anxious to give them. I think there are many Christian people who forget all about this at the present time. There are Christians who say, you know, I'm saved, that's all right, I'm not interested in anything else. I'm not a theologian, I don't want to read these great books. But my dear friend, you have no right to remain a babe. You have no right not to exercise your senses. Ah, but I'm a practical man. You say, I'm a great worker. You have no right to divide yourself up in that way. It should be the ambition and the desire of every Christian to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. You should read all the best books you can, study your scriptures, get the knowledge as deep and as profound as is capable. Exercise your senses. Because, say, these authors, if you don't do that, you can't receive the truth. If you remain a babe and if you don't grow and develop, you'll have to continue being spoon-fed with milk. And you'll never know anything about the strong meat of the word of God and of the doctrines of salvation. And thus, you see, it is possible for this apostle at one and the same time to say two things about these Roman Christians that seem to be contradictory. In chapter 15, in verse 14, he says this, I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And yet here he says, I speak to you, after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. And you see that there is no contradiction at all. They had got light, they had got spiritual understanding. Yes, but he says, you haven't got enough yet to follow this profound and deep doctrine that I'm teaching you in this chapter. And the two things are perfectly compatible with one another. Indeed, I can end by putting it in the words of our blessed Lord himself. He was talking about listening to the gospel, and this is what he said. Unto him that hath shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Take heed, he says, how ye hear. Unto him that hath shall be given. The more you understand this doctrine, the more you'll understand. And the more you'll understand, the more you'll get. And the more you'll get, the more you'll understand. And on and on and on it goes. You have to be a strong man before you can take strong meat. So our business, you see, is to grow and to develop, to exercise our senses. And if we do so, and as we do so, the use of analogies and illustrations will become less and less necessary. So we shan't be listening to the same simple gospel messages with the same sort of stories and illustrations. Fifty years hence, as we are doing now, we'll want something more, and we'll be able to take more. Is there anything so tragic as to observe Christian people remaining exactly the same at the end as they were at the beginning? Never growing, never developing. No, no, says our Lord. Unto him that hath shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Very well, then, I leave you with this question. 
What kind of food can we take? Are we still only capable of taking milk? Or are we beginning to develop a taste for meat? Are illustrations and analogies still essential? Or do we know something of the mind expanding under the new illumination of the spirit and a rejoicing in the deep things of God? The spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. I must confess that there is nothing that ever happens in my experience which depresses me more than this. Sometimes when I'm preaching away, and I have preached what I would have thought were the very elements and the beginnings of the Christian faith, people come to me and say, you know you were making rather a demand upon us this evening or this afternoon? They say, we are not accustomed to those deep things. Deep things. And I thought I was being elementary. That's amongst Christian and evangelical people. My dear friends, let us realize then these fundamental principles. Though we are in Christ, this infirmity remains. And we must fight against it. We must read, we must study, we must meditate, we must grow, we must exercise the faculties, we must grapple with these immensities. Hard to be understood, I agree with Peter, but apply your minds, therefore, struggle with them. Insist upon getting an understanding. And if you've got a willing heart and a willing desire, you can be certain that the Spirit will ever come to your aid. And you will grow not only in grace, but in the knowledge of the Lord. I speak after the manner of men. Because of the infirmity of your flesh, watch every word that this apostle writes. You will find gems of deep truth in what on the surface appears to be nothing but a casual passing remark. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we do indeed come into thy holy presence once more, and we come to thank thee and to praise thy name. We thank thee above all for the perfection of thy plan of salvation, for the way in which it thus reduces us all to the same level of inability and nothingness, and thereby holds out a hope for all. We thank thee for it. We bless, we magnify thy name. We glory in so great a salvation. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit Abide and continue with us now this night, throughout the remainder of this hour, short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.